Welcome to the Provocateurs Podcast, enabling you to think differently about leadership. Hello, I'm Stuart Craner. I'm the co-founder of Thinkers 50, and I would like to welcome you to the monthly podcast series, Provocateurs, in which we explore the experiences, insights, and perspectives of inspiring leaders. Our aim is to provoke you to think and act differently through conversations with some fantastic people. This is a collaboration between Thinkers 50 and Deloitte. So my co-host today is Stacey Janiak. Stacey is the Chief Growth Officer for Deloitte, responsible for how the firm interacts with its clients. Stacey, welcome. Thank you, Stuart. It's great to be here, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to this conversation with Debbie. So our first episode with Valerie and then Dan, Valerie Rainford and then Dambisa Moyo have set the bar really high, but uh, today's guest is right up there with Valerie and Dambisa. She is Debbie Debbie Beale. Debbie is the president and founder of the Posse Foundation. Uh, the Posse model is rooted in the belief that a small, diverse group of talented students, a posse, carefully selected and trained, can serve as a catalyst for increased individual and community development. Posse started in 1989 because one student who said, I never would have dropped out of college if I'd if I had my posse with me. The Posse Foundation identifies public high school students with extraordinary academic and leadership potential and places them in supportive multicultural teams. Since 1989, Posse's partner coll colleges have awarded $1.6 billion in scholarships and more than 10,000 scholars have so far been selected. Posse scholars graduate at a rate of 90%. The numbers are incredible, but today we also want to learn more about the story behind Posse and its development, as well as the insights gathered along the way by its founder and leader. Uh, Debbie, welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Can we begin by going back to the inception of the, the Posse Foundation? What, what, made, what made you take the leap? You know, uh, people ask me that question all the time, right? How did you start Posse? But, you know, I was a kid myself, basically. I was 23 years old. I was working for the City Kids Foundation in New York City. It's a, um, it was an after-school youth repertory program. Um, and I knew a lot of really smart, incredibly talented young people from all over New York, from every borough, Staten Island and the Bronx, from Brooklyn, from Queens. And these students were going off to college, just as you would imagine they would, right? Um, they had so much promise. And then six months later, many of them would be back home. They had dropped out. And it really didn't make sense because of their brilliance. But at the time, the word posse was kind of a cooler word in the youth culture, right? It meant my group of friends, the people who backed me up, my crew, my cohort. And one student literally said, well, I never would have dropped out of college if I'd had my posse with me. And we thought, well, that's a great idea, right? Why not send a team of students together to college so they could back each other up? And that way, if you grew up in the Bronx and you end up in Nashville, Tennessee or Middlebury, Vermont, right, you'd be a little less likely to say I'm leaving. So it wasn't that I was such, um, um, uh, it wasn't that it was so much my idea. It was that it, I was at the right place at the right time. And the great idea came from a young person. And I was lucky enough to be able to get to work on it. Debbie, how, what were the steps that, that you saw that you needed to take to kind of take advantage of converting, I think, as we would call it, the the if to a when, like this is a when. So what were some of the steps that, that you had to undertake? Right. And Provoke is such a good book because it really captures some of the ideas that we think we take for granted. You know, for example, if you put this for me personally, if I put a date on the calendar, I believe it will happen. Right. It, it gives me a deadline. It gives me something to work towards. And in the beginning, when you're starting something new, right, what do you do to make it happen? And there's a few things, right, aside from putting the date on the calendar. Um, and one of them is making sure you have the right people on the team. Who's on your team, 
right? Those of us who think we can do something by, by, our, by ourselves, we're just fooling ourselves, right? You always need a team. You always need a crew. You always need a posse to help you make something happen. And so what did we do? We got Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee to say, you know what? I like this idea. I'll take, I'll take a chance on this idea. And Vanderbilt was very white, very Southern, very wealthy, right? The girls wore dresses to the football games. So they needed help, right? Recruiting a much more diverse student body. And so they said, we'll try it. So we had Vanderbilt, right? We had a professor at Vanderbilt, Terry Deal, who was willing to be a champion for the idea on campus and to help us build networks of support on campus. It's, you know, so there were lots of things like that that helped get the idea off the ground. So Debbie, you were born in Manhattan and grew up in New Jersey. I and mean, I read somewhere that you wanted to become a writer and an illustrator of children's books. So were there any seeds in your childhood for, for the, the route, uh, the Posse Foundation, the route you've taken? <laughs> I mean, I wonder how many of us uh, actually become what we dream we're going to be when we're kids, you know? So there's so much opportunity that we don't know yet will exist for us as we we take our life's path. My dad was a musician in the New York Philharmonic. He played bassoon and contrabassoon. And my mom did PR for the New York State Psychiatric Institute. I grew up in a suburban town in New Jersey. And I had no idea that my life would be like this, right? I'm 56 years old now. Um, but I will say that the way I was raised influenced the way I developed this organization, which is my, my voice was always important at the dinner table. My parents always asked, um, for the opinion from me and from my sister, they always respected us as young people. And I think those values became core values at Posse. So there was influence there from the beginning. Is that what you're asking, Stuart? Yeah, yeah, no, it's it just yeah. it's, it's interesting because you were very young when it started. I mean, you were you were you were twenty, 20 college, yeah. yeah, you were twenty three, which is mm -hmm. very young to start. Well, it, I, I suppose people do start organizations at that age, but they tend to outgrow them or move move elsewhere. But you, but you've stuck. You've developed alongside it. It's yeah. that's true. Were there were there pivotal moments along the way, Debbie? I mean, obviously the importance of your upbringing was uh, uh, on point and, and I tend to agree with that. I think you're really mm -hmm. shaped by these early years, but as you as you look at that, reaching that, that ripe age of 23 to kick this <laughs> off, were there other pivotal moments that you would look to that say really put you on that trajectory? Yeah, lots of them, tons of them, right? Good and bad. But I think, um, if I was going to stress the most important values that drove what what drove the development of the Posse Foundation is that we never strayed from the mission, that we were very very focused, that we knew how to say no, and we can talk about what that means if you want. Um, we knew how to say no in order to protect the values and the integrity of the program and mission. Um, and then personally, right, as the person who's in charge of this organization, there were some moments when I had to make a decision, right? After eight years of developing Posse, I left Posse, right? I said, you know what? I think I want to leave and further my education. And I went back to school to get my doctorate. And someone else took over, right? I stayed on the board and I you know, kind of did consulting from the outside. But that's a big move for a founder to leave, right? And why did I come back? Because the person who was running Posse got pregnant and she said, you should come back. And to shorten the story, I came back. But I came back with a very different perspective, right? I had my doctorate. I had built a different kind of network of in academia. I um, had a different knowledge base. And that was extraordinarily helpful in giving me a different kind of perspective in how to run a nonprofit and how to help it develop and grow in a successful way. 
you know, had I not gone back to school, had I not said yes to coming back, all of these things affect, you know, where our, where our life takes us and what happens with the work we do. I do want to come back to the no's because it's hard to, I think it's harder to say no and to do it in the right way. So I'd love to hear your experiences there as I'm sure our listeners would. Yeah. You know, core to the mission of Posse, and for those people listening, maybe they're interested in Posse, right? It's this really unusual idea of recruiting young people from diverse backgrounds who might not show up on the radar screen of these elite institutions. So to imagine, you know, you don't have the best SAT score. Imagine you didn't go to the best ranked high school, but now you have a chance to go to to Brandeis and Bryn Mawr or Hamilton. You get to go to Cornell University. Maybe you go to Northwestern, right? These are amazing colleges and universities. Um, so from the president's perspective, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to get as much opportunity for these young people as I can. I cannot wait to add another college partner. I can't wait to add another university. Why? Because those colleges and universities give the scholarships. They're committing millions of dollars in scholarships, which is a part of what's interesting about the model. I don't have to raise scholarship dollars. I have to get these colleges signed on. So if a college says they're interested, I jump. I'm getting to the no part. But but the core, what are the core values of the organization, right? We are a strength-based model. We recruit young people who have leadership and academic potential, who can knock it out of the park, who are brilliant. We don't screen for race. We don't screen for need. We're a merit-based model. The only merit-based diversity initiative that I know of in the United States. So if a school says to me, oh, wow, we want posse, but we don't need white kids in the posse because we got plenty of white kids on our campus. We just really, could you recruit a posse of black people for us? We would say no. If a school said, wow, we love posse, what a great idea, but you know what? We really just wanna give need-based aid because we'd rather that our aid go to students who really need it rather than students who don't need it. I know you have a merit model, but could you just create a need-based model? We'll give you 10 scholarships a year. We say no. And there were times when I had to do both of those things, turn down millions of dollars in opportunity for these young people because we were sticking to our mission. That's hard. That is hard to do that, especially when you're growing especially when you're a new organization. And I bet that people listening are wondering, well, why would you do that? Those seem like very reasonable requests on the, on the college's part. And it may probably would take too long for this podcast, but what's important, the message I'm trying to give you is that when you have a mission, it's easy to um, participate in mission creep. Take the million dollars because it's a million dollars. You need that money. Even if the donor wants to do something different than what you're doing. No, you can't take the money or you have to redirect it, redirect them. So I don't know if you want to ask more questions about that, but that's where that's that's what I mean. So it's keeping that sense of focus is, is really difficult, isn't it? Because there's so many temptations and issues like as you've just just laid out but there's so many as things are taking off with the posse foundation you must thought oh we could do this we could do that you could right move into different areas you could lose the focus so easily and there's not many organizations re manage to retain it in no matter what right. area they're in and it's true for all of us as individuals in our careers we need to know what our non-negotiables are Right. When you're building something, whether you're building your own career or you're building an organization or a company, what are the non-negotiables? Right. Where will you not compromise and where can you compromise? What is flexible? Yeah. What, at what point as, as Posse, you started Posse, at what, at, at what point did you think this is really going to take off? Wow. Was it after six months, 18 months? 
At what, at what point did you think, oh, yeah, this is really, this is really going, going places? Number of scholars when you reach 100, 1,000? It's such a good question. No one's ever asked me that question in that way before. You know, in the beginning, we always had the vision that this could be more than just at one college or one university, right? There's 10 students in a posse. So is it when we recruited the second posse? Wow, we could have a posse every year and we could, you know, go on forever with this one college? Was it when we added a second university? I think for me, when I saw that this could be something big, was in, we started the program in 1989. 10 years later, in 1999, we finally said, let's try replicating this program in a different city. We had been in New York for 10 years. We had added some partner colleges and universities. We were sending teams of students every year to these schools. But the Department of Education, the Federal Department of Education gave us a grant to try to replicate the program in Boston. And I was getting my doctorate at the time, so I could be there, I could watch it, you know, while Posse was still running its, its, its program in New York. So this FIPSI gave us this grant and we opened in Boston. It was a huge success. And one year later, we opened in Chicago, two years later in DC. And we kept going until we were in Los Angeles, New Orleans, uh, Miami, Houston, the Bay Area. We, we just kept growing until we were in 10 cities by the year 2015. Incredible growth. And I think part of that is because we had perfected the model, right? Like, you know, here's 10 years of really working on it, codifying it, making sure it's, it's brilliant. So maybe then when we got that grant from, from DC. The ability to see true the purpose for those 10 years, I have to believe was really critical to be able to then launch because you weren't diverted from the mission Yeah, at all. Now you did manage through and are managing through still some really challenging times, both, uh, you know, reading about how you managed through the impact of 9-11 uh, and shepherding wow. the organization at that time. And now through the pandemic and just the onset of virtual and, and thinking about that from a strategic perspective, I'd love to hear more about that experience and, and how that's impacting your future vision for Posse. Yeah. You know, to connect it to your last question, right? we i was there's nobody on staff we're not even a 501c3 you know in 1989 there's five kids there's 10 kids there's 20 kids and today right i walk into our offices at 14 wall street and i walk past this row of posters of young people in their caps and gowns who've graduated from college and they're on to become CEOs and college presidents. And there's now more than 10,000 of them out there. And I connect that because I was there in the beginning when we hardly had our foot in the door. And today when we have 64 partner colleges and universities, we recruit 800 new students every year. So your question, you know, well, what happened after 9-11 and what happened during the pandemic? There's, there's always things that get in the way, right? And I remember we were having a national staff training in, in September in, in New York City back in 2001. And the, our staff was coming in from Chicago. They were coming in from Boston. And I was in a, um, I tried to go into the subway to go downtown. And it was filled with people. I couldn't even get down the stairs. I thought, what's going on? And I heard someone say, oh, a plane crashed into the World Trade Center. So I said, oh my God, that was horrible. Let me get a taxi, I think. I'm from the Upper West Side, I'm gonna get a taxi to go all the way downtown to 14 Wall Street, which for people listening might not realize is two blocks away from the World Trade Center. So I get in a taxi and the, the taxi driver has his radio on. And I said, can you take me down to Wall Street? He said, I'm not going down to Wall Street. 
I said, okay, take me to 42nd Street. I'll get a subway there. So he tries, starts trying to drive downtown, and we hear on the radio that the second plane hits the World Trade Center. And you know, all of us, wherever we were, however we found out, we knew at that moment, this, this is not, this is very out of the ordinary. This is a terrorist attack. And I told him to turn around and I went home we, my husband had the TV on, right? And it was this incredible series of um, moments of communication. We had staff flying in who saw the World Trade Center hit from their airplanes. They looked out the window. We had staff trying to cross the, the Triborough Bridge to get from the airport to New York on foot with their suitcases. We had staff that were trapped already at 14 Wall Street in the basement of the building, right? We had all of this stuff going on. So you're leading the organization, right? I'm thinking, okay, what do I do? And, and the feeling, think of this, it's September. This is when young people are being nominated for the Posse Scholarship. What do we do? So obviously, Everybody finds their hotel. We finally get everybody home. We are all safe. And the next day, we called a meeting on the roof of my apartment building. It was a beautiful day. And we made a plan. We said we could, we could pause Posse or we could keep going. And this is where networks come in, right? I called the, the president of the college board the college board gave us free space in one of their conference rooms. They gave us a fax machine. They gave us computers. And we didn't miss a beat. We had thousands of kids nominated for the Posse Scholarship. And we interviewed them. And that December, they got their scholarships. They got admitted to college. But it's that moment when you're making the decision, right? It's such a horrible event. Maybe we should pause. But I think if one thing characterizes Posse, it's that we don't pause. We acknowledge, we, we understand that people need to take a minute. We need to recognize when there's hardship, but we can't press pause. During the pandemic, if you want me to tell that briefly, I don't know if I'm talking too much. No, that's, that's perfect. Yeah, no, it'd be interesting. Yeah, I mean, obviously, 9-11 was a, a traumatic experience, but uh, it'd be interesting how you responded to the pandemic equally more recently. Yeah. The pan <laughs> so all of us have been experiencing the pandemic. It's a collective trauma, right? We're, we on, In March, like a lot of people, we went home, right? And we, we went to our apartments and houses and, you know, we tried to figure out how we can work from there. And we thought we could survive. And Posse did not just survive. Our staff knocked it out of the park, right? We interviewed 17,000 nominated students on Zoom. We selected our 10,000th scholar on Zoom. We, we realized, I guess, that we could still run our program even from our bedrooms. So I woke up, I remember I woke up one morning and I thought, oh my God, this is working. It works. The technology allows us to still deliver program. It's not in person, which we, we care that it's in person, but it's not in person. It still works. And I had an idea. I thought, what if, what if we went to cities we could never be in? Because now we have the technology. We don't have to be there physically. So I called Arnie Duncan right, the former Secretary of Education under Obama. I called Alberto Carvalho, who is was at the time the um, superintendent of Miami-Dade Public Schools. And I said, will you help me? Will you co-host a Zoom meeting with the superintendents of these cities that we've never been in? They said yes. All of the superintendents came to this Zoom meeting. And overnight, literally in one day, we doubled the number of cities from which we can recruit kids. And now we're in Dallas and Cleveland and Newark. Now we're in Philadelphia. We're in Las Vegas. We're in cities we had never been able to.
to say yes to before. So I guess maybe my message in this is that we need to acknowledge hardship and, and we have to understand that it affects us each differently, but we can also embrace opportunity and plow through even when it's hard to make sure we don't give up on the young people that we so care about. What, what do you think of as your, your core skills? Debbie, you, you haven't got a pause button. You're, you're very disciplined and kept the focus. You're very pur purpose driven. You're very passionate about about what you do. But how, how do you view what what you're good at and what you what you're bringing to the organisation? Um, I'd rather have you tell me what I'm good. The um, I think that I I my focus is usually um, infrastructure and making sure people don't give up and i i think leaders you ask leaders you know what's one of the hardest things to deal with and i think a lot of leaders will say trying to convince people who think it can't happen or you can't do this or it isn't a good idea and it becomes one of our most important responsibilities because change is scary and uncomfortable, even if it's a great idea, right? So as a leader, you got to kind of lead people through that, I think, and help them see what's possible. So maybe those two things. Well, maybe to, to build on that, one of the provocateur superpowers is an ability to overcome blinders that mm. can be caused by bias, whether that's individual or, or collective bias. How do you, how do you think you're able to do that? How have you encountered that and, and kind of overcome that? It's like um, music, right? You've got to kind of find the rhythm if you dwell too long in an analysis of what can go wrong, you'll never get to what's possible. You'll never get to executing the steps you need to take to make it possible. So it's this, it's this idea of balancing, right? Wanting to give people a chance in the space to talk about their fears and anxieties and knowing when to say, okay, we're, we're done doing that now. Time, time to take our, take the risk. I think that's part of it. Um, I don't know. Is that getting at what you're asking, Stacy? Yeah, I think so. I think you're, you're talking about how you kind of overcome the, the challenge and maybe the bias for uh, consistency, right? Or for status quo, you know, and the concern about change. Is which, as you said, is always scary, no matter what form it takes. Yeah. So, so when did you start seeing yourself as a leader, Debbie? I. That's just such a weird question, Stuart. Sorry, because because. <laughs> well, I don't. Well, you well when you started, you were twenty three, and and you started this amazing thing, and then had momentum, and did did you? I know you had a team around you, but you were the one who started it in the end. Yeah, but so the real truth, I I promise you this is the truth, right? I I get to be in the role that I'm in, right? That's a lot of luck. It's a huge privilege, right? But it's really not me. It's us. I swear I believe that. And any, I'll give you an example, any CEO or president of a nonprofit, any executive director that says she is amazing at raising money, it's, it, it's not right. It's not she. I, it's not, I'm not a great fund. I'm fine. I do well with the material you give me. The reason I can raise millions of dollars is because of my board. It's because of our team, our staff. I just get to be in this role. I think a lot of leaders will say that to you. I think, I hope. It's a mistake not to know it's we. And so I don't feel like, I feel like I'm the leader by name, but it's really a team of us. So that, so therefore, so the team is the uh, is the engine of yes, the organization. Totally. But mm -hmm. how do you how do you keep that feeling going? 
I mean, there's a lot of people who aren't team players we, we encounter in life, and a lot of people have got the the ego. They want they want to be the leader. Mm -hmm. How do you keep the culture fresh and uh, invigorated? Well, first of all, don't hire those people. Right. Seriously, hire people that they say, I got this right. Hire people who are positive, who are really smart. I care about that more than experience. Right. Really smart people that want to make things happen, who are positive, who help create culture. One person cannot create culture. Right. You need people to kind of infect each other with it. So you got to hire the people who are like that. Right. But you also want again back to the beginning you want them to stay true to the mission you want especially a nonprofit. we don't pay as big a salary for people as we do in corporate so you've got to have an organization that has a lot of integrity where you get to see outcomes and impact where you get to feel the importance of the work you do and where you get to have fun you need to like who you work with and have a good time so and I would imagine, Debbie, that um, it, it also comes back to finding people that are um, aligned with the purpose. I mean, you've been a very mission purpose driven organization. So I would assume that that is yep. really relevant uh, as you both recruit and build your team. Yeah. And I'll give you an example. You know, I know this is really. I'm genuinely saying this about Deloitte. Deloitte is an example. We have over 200 corporate partners, but Deloitte is at the top, right? Top of the list. And the reason is that Deloitte a lot has, there's a lot of alignment in what Deloitte is trying to do philanthropically and what Posse is about. And we ended up over a long period of time developing a relationship that now feels almost like we are one together. And Deloitte, not only funds Posse because Deloitte believes in the work, but provides pro bono support to us, space for events, internships, jobs, um, volunteers. In fact, we have a Deloitte person on every one of our boards, two people on our national board. When I think about that's something different today than when we started this organization, right? To dream that a company like Deloitte would do so much for an organization like Posse, wasn't in, it wasn't even something I could have imagined, right? But as you grow and become more established, those things become possible. And that helps too, right? No one does this alone. How do you stay fresh and enthusiastic, Debbie? Along the way, I mean, you've been with Posse apart from your, your when you went to Harvard, it's 33 years. Which, yeah. Well, have you ever been tempted to go join another organization? No, um, I really love Posse. I really love what's happening. I feel like if I personally wasn't learning anymore, maybe then I would leave, you know, and I do want to leave. I don't want to stay forever. And I think, you know, the person who should take my job should be a Posse alum. Wouldn't that be good? That would be good. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be, no, that'd be nice and circular. Yeah. So it's it's the learning that keeps you fresh and engaged. Yeah, and I and I have the best time. Of, I feel that I have the best job in the world. I wake up every morning. I can't wait to go to work. I feel that the people here are are my true friends. You know, the people that I work with every day. I can't imagine better people than than they. I there's nothing about posse that makes me feel like I don't want to be here. Not yet anyway. So is there anything as you, as you look back that you are, you are most proud of, of what Posse has achieved or what you've accomplished? I mean, yeah. Um, I, I, these young people, right. What, what we did was we recognized talent. And there's so much racism in our systems in this country. And, you know, we've, we've created a new framework for thinking about diversity, one that is not based on a deficit. And I'm really proud of us for sticking to that. We have created opportunities for extraordinarily talented young people, and I'm watching them become 
leaders in their own right. I like to tell Shirley's story. She knows I always tell this story. And if you go to our website, her story is in our video. She's this Dominican kid who grew up in Brooklyn. Her dad drove a yellow cab and she had terrible SAT scores. She's a really brilliant person, so smart. She gets into the very first posse. She goes to Vanderbilt. She graduates with honors. She gets her doctorate in clinical psychology from Duke University. She becomes the dean of the college at Middlebury. And a few years ago, Shirley became the president of Ithaca College, the first Dominican American to be president of a four-year college in the entire United States. And she is not an anomaly. There are thousands of Posse scholars following in her footsteps, becoming CEOs, becoming leaders of organizations, you know, leading movements, running for office. And I feel great that we created a infrastructure that allowed, helped make that happen. Okay, well, that just gave me goosebumps. So I would add to your skill set being an amazing storyteller, which I think oh. is probably why you're also able to raise millions of dollars. Oh, thanks, Stacey. You, you also developed the, the Beale Dale College Adaptability Index, Debbie. Can you, can you tell us about, about that? Can you explain what it is and, and why, why you developed it and how that came about and why it's important to your work? Well, when I, when I went back to, um, to get my doctorate and I was trying to think of what I wanted to do for my, you know, my dissertation, I wanted to write about this dynamic assessment process that we had designed at Posse to screen and interview thousands of students without focusing on the SAT. And I thought, well, maybe what we were doing intuitively at Posse could be codified. Maybe I could codify it. And I created something called a College Adaptability Index with Stacy Dale. And we got a $1.9 million grant from the Andrew Mellon W. Mellon Foundation to support it. And I had great people working with me. Derek Bach was my uh, thesis advisor. He was the president of Harvard. And Gary Orfield, who was one of my beloved professors, and he's uh, co-founded the uh, Civil Rights Project. Anyway, I had great people. And so that's what that is, we, me trying to see if I could codify what we had done intuitively at Posse. And how has it contributed to, to your growth, do you think? No, I mean, I think it was, you know, we, it was, it was good to go through the exercise, but we don't use it. So it's, it, we, what we do at Posse really, really works the way we do it. And we don't need that tool that I designed, which I was thinking could be applied more broadly and maybe one day it will, but that's not my focus. I'd like to interview you two. That's really what I want to do. <laughs> everybody, everybody says that after a while, don't they? <laughs> yeah. The, um, and is, the, is, is the world a better place 33, 33 years on from starting the Posse Foundation? Do you feel more positively uh, about, about the world you're seeing in, in education and the opportunities for people? Oh, my God. 100% yes. We have a long ways to go, right? But we now have these, you know... 60 plus colleges and universities that are really with us together, you know, learning about how to talk about inclusion and equity. Um, there's been a lot of development in the DEI world in the conversation, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement and other movements trying to push us to think differently about race and gender and class have been effective you know, we've all been paying a mu much more attention to it. You know, with the murders of George Floyd and others, you know, we felt pressure. And Posse was there playing an important role in leading the conversation and in helping others to think about how to bring that conversation into their companies. You know, we launched Posse Consulting, which does that, takes all of our experience and brings it into corporate. We do that with you, Deloitte, too. So... I think a lot, a lot has 
happens, that's good. You know, understanding that we need a multiracial approach to addressing racial bias is really important, right? It can't just be one group of people. Hey, Debbie, anything that you, as you think back, um, that you would have done differently? Oh, a million things. <laughs> but Any important ones as you think about our listeners that might be embarking on their own uh, provocative future? Yeah, you know, one personal thing that, I've, that I still am not good at, and I try to work on it, is I think I'm... I dig my heels in a lot. You know, when I think I'm right, <laughs> I think I get really narrow and I don't listen as well as I could. And I, so that's one thing, because I think the more we figure out how to work together, even when we disagree, the better outcome we'll have. I, I think I used to, and tell me if I'm doing this now, but I think I used to over explain everything because I cared so much about what I was doing and I wanted the person listening to know every single little detail. That was a huge mistake. I think organizationally, you know, we've done the right things. Um, but personally, I made a million mistakes, you know feeling insecure, not confident. I used to be the youngest person in the room. That's not the case anymore, right? But it's hard to be the youngest person in the room, you know, so. Is it is it easier being the oldest person in the room? Yes. <laughs> it's easier but because you don't care as much about being wrong or making a mistake. You know, you know, you know that, you know, you're more secure. You know, life goes on. Life goes on. Yeah. yeah. So, so where next for Posse then? Where where do you see it going in five years or or ten years? You may may not be involved in five years or ten years, but where in your mind have you had a clear idea where you want it to go and you would like it to go? Yep, we're going to recruit eight hundred and thirty new students this year for our partner schools. We want to get to the point where we're recruiting a thousand new students a year, right? young people who are seniors in high school who will participate in the pre-college program. We will support 4,000 students a year on campus, right? Think about it, 1,000 in every class. And we'll graduate about 1,000 students a year into the workforce. So what I want to have happen is to get to that 1,000 by adding new college partnerships and build something that we're calling the Century of Leaders Fund. This is my favorite idea that we're working on right now. If I could raise a half a billion dollars, that's doable. That money would be invested and would generate enough money that I could give each of our 100 partner institutions a quarter of a million dollars a year. That would guarantee the program in perpetuity and in numbers, and let me tell you what that means. It means 10,000 Posse scholars for the United States every decade, 100,000 leaders in a century, a century of leaders. And think about who they are, young people who deserve this chance, who will go to great colleges and then become CEOs, senators, and college presidents. Yeah, fantastic concept. Mm -hmm. And do you see America doesn't have a monopoly on the, on these these problems and challenges? Have you have, no. you have you thought of going beyond the states? Yep, yep. You could do Posse Canada. You could do Posse. We actually just we we just have been talking to a couple of different people in different countries about the idea. But it's different. The higher ed system is different there. You know, the demographics are different. I think the concept could work well. Maybe we just help them develop their own posse type concept. But yeah. Yep. Yeah, posse Europe is what I was, what right. I was looking for, Debbie. Okay, you're going to help me, Stuart. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh... what, what about you personally? Where, 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 do you, where do you go next, do you think? I don't know. I'm here for now. Do, do, you, do you plan ahead? I plan ahead for the organization, but not for myself. 
Do you? Do you plan ahead? Uh, no. <laughs> you don't. You live in the moment, Stuart, or you dwell in the past? <laughs> no, no, I, I don't. I, planning is uh, for career, career-wise and job-wise is 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 dangerous because I think you're cutting down options, yeah. interest, interesting avenues along point. the way. But that's what's interesting about your story is you've combined um, the kind of discipline element of st sticking with it, and you've 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 said no to lots of interesting, no doubt, interesting potential avenues, and that's that's really uh, and that's really difficult. And whilst Stacey, keeping, keeping fresh. Stacy, do you plan ahead? I do plan ahead, but scenario plan ahead. And know that none of those scenarios are actually going to happen. But by mm -hmm. planning ahead, it opens my eyes, opens my mind to what things could be. Oh, I love that. Who, who, who's been your mentor along the way, Debbie? Have you worked with people or throughout the last 30 years who, who have inspired you and helped you tons of them you mentioned Derek Bach and, and oh. people like that Gary Orfield and Derek Bach hugely important to me my father and my mother hugely important to me um but so many people along the way I I mean I learn from people all the time I think like Arnie Duncan I learned a lot from him I admire him enormously people who are able to stay calm when they're talking about things that they're enraged by, I'm learning from them right now, right? I, so important to me to learn from those people. It's a big flaw that I have. Mm. There's a lot to be angry about. <laughs> yeah. and, and do you act as a mentor? Do you, how do you, do you carry on that role in, in the organization? I, you know what? We have a role called mentor in our program. And these are tenured faculty members who take on an entire posse for two years, the first two years of college. I think if I had to say the single most important programmatic element, I would point to them. You know, once in a while I'm lucky and I get a posse scholar who wants to hang out with me. But remember, I'm like the old person in the corner here who's kind of always working on her computer and phone and I'm not the and I don't need I don't need that I don't need to be in their lives I really don't and I but I'm watching all the time you've, you've mentioned luck a couple of times Debbie mm -hmm. you, you you feel with posse that luck was uh, an important element in, in in its success yeah you know there's a question we ask is your success mostly because of hard work, luck, or destiny? You know, think about, you know, Stacy and Stuart, think about for yourself, how would you answer that question? All of the above. Right, all of the above. But if you had to pick one that without it, you know, and I know it's, it's easier to say all of them, right? But I think, that I am incredibly lucky. You know, I'm not the only smart person in the world. I'm not the only person who's driven and passionate, hardworking. I think I'm just lucky. I don't think that I deserve my position or my salary more than someone who makes less doing something different. But is that is that what keeps you going? Luck? No, no, the fact that you, you think you don't deserve it. No, no, I don't think about, I, you know, I'm just saying I'm not, I don't feel like this is, has, is coming to me, you know, like I, ha, I'm here, you know, what keeps me going is I just love this. It's, I love what I'm doing. I believe in the mission. I'm much more motivated by social justice today than I was when I was 23. And I was just in the right place at the right time. Are you optimistic? About? About the world and, and the, the causes you're, you're impacting? Yes. Yes. There's one there's can I end with one one comment? Yeah. Yeah. So a, it's, a, it's a concept I learned from from you all at Deloitte about pounding the table. And I think a lot of people in this country and, and elsewhere wonder what they could possibly do to make a difference. 
the problems are so overwhelming. But if you pound the table for one person who isn't showing up on the radar screen, who isn't getting a chance, a promotion, an assignment, who's not getting an opportunity to be part of the team, who doesn't get asked out to lunch, just one person, if we all do that, we will make dramatic change, dramatic change. So I just want to leave people with that one idea, right? Posse's pounding the table for all of these young people. But if each of us do that for just one person, things will change. Love that. Kindness is infectious. And champion. Are you okay. oh. <laughs> kindness and allyship, right? You're really yeah. talking about sponsorship. Yeah. Yeah. Important. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Debbie. Thank you. Thank you so much, both of you, Stacey and Stuart. <laughs>